Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Christine Miller. Christine, welcome. Oh, gosh, Gary and Beth, thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited. Uh, we have got a truckload of things to talk about here, uh, from needlework to weaving to education to coral reefs. Um, this could take a day, so... Uh, I think I have enough uh, uh, storage space in the machine here to collect all that, so we'll be all right. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, I, I will stay on point and uh, <laughs> not wander off down the path too far, I promise. Okay, the, the, the thing I want to get to first is education, art and education, and I, I have to say I shed a little tear when I heard or read about the teacher you, you – always wanted to be an artist and the teacher that shut you down uh, mm -hmm. early on and that you mm -hmm. persevered that story is like, I want to grab that teacher by the neck and just scream. Well, it's so ironic. Um, so just what happened was in the sixth grade, the art teacher came to our classroom and, and I'm a woman of a certain age. So this was, you know, back in the sixties Um and I was a very good student, uh, kind of a straight-A student type, and I got a C in art. And I can't even tell you why I got a C. I don't know that it was ever really revealed to me what my problem was. But that... <laughs> Your problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you think you have a problem. And so I just... Art fell off the radar for me and I went into music and I did singing and you know whatnot it wasn't until I went back when when I went to college uh, as a young woman that I had the courage to circle back to art because I had started weaving and at UT Austin you couldn't take any art classes if you weren't an art major so I had to change my major so I could just ba take some basic design courses and talk about being nervous. Like I just walked into those classrooms, a sweaty ball of anxiety <laughs> because those people had been taking art classes, you know, through their junior high and high school years. Right. And, um, but I, you know, what happened and I, I would share this story with my students. Now I was an art teacher that taught in high school, um, nine through 12, grade and they they were so funny they would be they'd show me their work and they'd say miss you know what do you think about this and I'd say oh you know I really like this or that and they say no don't lie you know you can tell me the truth it sucks and you know I just I never would when I would give constructive criticism to a, a child or an adult I will never shut them down completely. And I will really find the things that are successful that are going on in their work to, um, to let them know that they're right, They're on the right path. Right. There's right. one of the things I loved saying to my students and even my adult students now is there's no right or wrong in art. There's just this or that. And the art classroom is the one place in education that fosters creative problem solving and divergent thinking and really helps, you know, strengthen that thinking process um, with the freedom of not being wrong about what they do. When you entered that art world, a world of people who've been doing art forever, and uh, and you're just a, a blank slate. How, I mean, I can imagine the intimidation factor, but but you fought through that. Of course, you had what was it in third grade? You were knitting during recess, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but <laughs> so you had little little resistance in you to begin with because you just kept doing it. But how did you fight through that? How did you say, wait a minute, I, I have my own personal goals here. Uh, I'm going to make this happen. Uh, in spite of the fact that everybody around me is, is already so skilled? You know, it, that's a really good question. And, and I, I don't think I've ever been cognizant of the 
fighting through it. I think that, and I kind of owe this to my family, our family has a can-do sort of spirit about us, especially the women in my family, and they were great models for me, and I would see my mother or my aunt launch into these projects with very little background in it, you know, like reupholstering furniture or copying clothing that they see in a department store window. And I, I, I just think that probably that modeling I had just was so innate that I just kept going and would continue investigating. Um, and now when it comes to, to fiber and just being creative and artists, I mean, here's this teacher that shut me down. My whole life has been centered around art. So, you know, you have to be careful about who you listen to sometimes, don't you, Gary? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to check that out. I mean, people can give you advice and you have to really kind of go into your internal space and go, does that really resonate with me or is that something I really need to think about? Because sometimes they're not right and you need to keep going. Yeah, well, and, and that whole thing, you know, that, I mean, that's teaching 101. Uh, it doesn't matter what class or what subject. You find something positive with every student student uh, to give them a starting point to build on. And, and if they, at some point, that subject doesn't work for them, they'll sort that out. But you keep giving them those opportunities. I mean, it, it, it's really not teaching, it's parenting. Uh, you you put the opportunities in front of, of your kids and uh, let them figure out what their path is. And to to impose on a path on a student is is just so dead wrong. Um, it, it frustrates me. Yeah, it's true. And now you you have worked quite a bit to further the the inclusion of arts in you know, to add the a to stem to make it steam is, is is that been an uphill battle or have you found people who are listening to you well i think it's both one thing and beth you may relate to this because you you homeschooled your kids right yes i did yeah one thing I, I don't like about our current educational model, I mean, I understand it, but it's all chopped up into these various subjects, right? And then you go to science, and then you go to math, and then you go to art. And so that it kind of, you know, tells the, the student that these are separate areas of learning. Um, when in fact, as you both know, everything crosses over into everything else. Um, and so when it comes to STEM and STEAM, um, I think that absolutely you can see that the STEAM uh, has really picked up a lot. And I, I give things like TED Talks, you know, credit for helping to educate the world about the, the dance of art and science together. But... Um, <clears throat> That's where all the that's where innovation lies is in is in that creative thinking of art and so I, I do see it it you know blossoming in this century and I think that you know we're going to see a lot of change in educational uh, structures and paradigms as you know just as COVID is has come in and sort of redefined how we can communicate with each other I think there's going to be a lot of continued change. And, and I hope that I see more of that across discipline uh, integration, you know, like problem-based learning is, is just, it's so real world. And I think that's why kids are attracted to it because they can, it's not just some theoretical framework that they feel that someone's kind of forcing them to memorize or to regurgitate. They actually can, can apply concepts across more than one area to see how they relate and how they really relate in the world. So I think it's a brave new world, Gary. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> well, that's encouraging because I haven't taught for, for some time now, but uh, I, I did two stints. And the first one, 
uh, all, all science, but the, the uh, veteran that I worked with as, as a rookie teacher, he had a whole curriculum and system that was based on that problem solving. You know, I'm not going to stand here and give you a bunch of answers to memorize so you can pass the test. And uh, so that was my first real teaching exposure, and I loved it. And then I had a, a break, and then I went back to teaching, and it was a situation where you know the kids, in some cases, literally just give me the answers so I can memorize it to pass the test. Oh, yeah. And I'm not, no, I'm not going to do that. You're going to go look it up. You're going to go figure it out. I'll show you. I'll give you the tools, and I'll show you. Uh, where to find the answers, but you're going to do that work because me telling me just telling you what to regurgitate on a test is just not going to do any of us any good, and plus it's really boring. Uh, so, uh, so I'm glad to hear that that there's that the thinking is changing because these standardized tests just drive me nuts. Uh, that's that's not education, and it doesn't expose kids to the world of opportunity that that uh, is before them. Uh, it's it's yuck. <laughs> So. Yeah, and you know, um, it, 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 it's interesting. I don't know much about Hindu gods, but I think about Shiva, who is the god of of destruction and the god of creation. And and when I first heard that, I thought, wow, that just that's like an oxymoron, right? You know, how can you be the the god of both of these things? Well, I think we're seeing that in our world now. We're going to have to take some of these systems down to recreate a system that is going to serve humanity in better ways. And, and I, I just continue to be optimistic about that. And so, it, you know, it, it, it helps to have that sort of framework of thinking to, to understand. It's like, maybe we, we can sort of get rid of this and move into this. And it's going to be very interesting. And, and of course it's, it's always a bumpy road when you are um, are doing that. But, um, you know, when I started teaching in the early 2000s, uh, I felt very excited about education becoming more student-centered, um, you know, incorporating uh, inquiry strategies to get kids to ask questions and to... And to you know, strengthen their divergent thinking. So I think it's all happening. I really do. It's a, uh, it's a big boat to turn though. Yeah, it think. is. <laughs> it yeah. sure is. Yeah. <laughs> Beth, when you were student, when you were uh, uh, homeschooling, did the materials that you worked with, uh, were they, you know, learn the facts, pass the test, or was it explore, learn, dig out answers, um, that kind of thing? And that's what, that was the joy of the homeschooling, um, and that was one of the reasons my husband and I chose it, is you could, I had a, a son who was very much interested from like the age of three or four in space, and so anything we did was related, he, that's what he wanted to look at. So we drew planets, we wrote stories about space, we went to, we lived close enough to Chicago, we went to the Adler planetarium and we did um their friday night they did stuff on friday nights that was very hands-on but we were able everything he touched had to do with space but it was like i'll never forget he made himself a black hole and um, my husband worked for a company there i got a lot of tape so it was basically this structure that came down as a cone out of paper and tape and wire that he made. I mean, he was little. I mean, he was like six maybe. And he made this funnel like a black hole. I don't know. It was a whole thing. And he explained everything that was around it. So we always integrated that. Even as they got older, the cur curriculum we used for history um, had something that was, you could do a uh, Yes, you could do something that was um, written. You had to do one of those. But you also had to do something that was a, a visual project. And so you had to do something hands-on. And I always tried to encourage them to do that, whether it was cooking or making something, you know, to, to use all of your God-given abilities. Um, and 
and I, that's what frustrated me about public school in a lot of ways. Is it doesn't always integrate all those areas. So I'd like to encourage parents, you know, try to incorporate that stuff. You know, let your kids have string and glue and <laughs> tape. And I know it's a mess. It's a mess. But eventually, but it teaches them that tactile skill, which they're, they need. And also it, it, it spurs on that creativity because I didn't have any idea how to make a, a black hole out of tape and paper, but my son worked it out, mm-hmm, <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, but if you don't, you know, if you don't give them that opportunity to problem solve, like you said, then they'll never, then you just say, well, this is how you're going to do it. This is the pattern. Well, you know, that's kind of boring after a while. So think out of the box. How yeah. can we make this work? with what we have. Right. Yeah. Now, Christine, you came to the education thing later in life because you, you tried and, and went through the, the uh, fiber arts uh, business uh, process and had some success but really didn't find what worked for you in that effort. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I... Um... I love selling things. So you know how some artists don't like to sell their work? Well, that is not me. (laughs) I mean, I was, I was top Girl Scout cookies, uh, sales girl, you know, I mean, I just, I love, uh, I love being with people and I, and I have made, oh good Lord, I have made, and I'm not exaggerating. I've probably made thousands of things in my life. I mean, thousands from little to big. And so what do you do with all that stuff? Well, you, you've got to, you've got to sell it or you, you know, you can give it away to a point and then people don't want you to give them. <laughs> oh no, here, here comes the Christmas gifts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, you know, and, uh, so I re I've reinvented myself as an artist many times. Um, you know, I've done the art shows. I call it being out on the street when you're in the tent and, Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's just a horrible mess because of the weather. And, um, you know, I've had galleries and I've had custom textile studios that I've I've done with with uh, friends of mine. And uh, every time I would sort of go down the path, I would get, oh, you know, maybe three years down the road or something. And then and then a brick wall just magically shot up through the ground and was right in front of me. And so I um, would have to, to pivot, you know, go left or right. And I will say in that question you asked earlier about, you know, pushing through, I, I think one thing that is kind of interesting about myself is I'm, I'm pretty fearless. I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable in risk taking. Now I want it to be, you know, fairly quantifiable, but, but, uh, I'm not averse to risking and trying something new. Um, so after about 10 years of that, I I never lost any money. Um, I was always able to keep things going, but it was really before the web got off the ground and, um, my daughter needed to go to college and we needed a car and Mr. Miller who had been my, my champion and supported me and my daughter during this uh, artistic phase, our family really needed some, some, you know, some cash, some cash. (laughs) Yes. Hey, how about a little insurance? We were both (laughs) self-employed and, oh, uh, you know, maybe we should start thinking about retirement in our 40s. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, teaching, I mean, I will tell you, I had a, a legit midlife crisis in my 40s. I had spent all these years, I had a gorgeous portfolio, but what would it translate into? And my father um, was an educator and he uh, and a couple other friends kind of planted the seed They go, well, why don't you become a teacher? And I thought, Hmm, you know, teaching art would keep me in the subject that I loved. Although secretly Gary, I kind of wish I'd been a science teacher because I love science (laughs) so much, but you know, when you've got, when your credits 
are tipping the scales, you just have to go with that, right? Yes. Right. <laughs> and so, um, so I went back to school at age 47. My daughter was in college, so Mr. Miller was now supporting two co-eds. <laughs> and, um, and I graduated with my art ed certification when I was 50. So that's when I started teaching. Um, and it, I, you know, I, I had lots of, of life experience and lots of other business experience. And so when I went into teaching, I thought, I really thought I kind of knew what I was getting myself in for. Huh. <laughs> what a joke. Um, there is no way. I, I always, when I have student teachers, and I also supervise pre-service teachers uh, for universities. And, you know, it's just a walk of fire, really. You, you, some people make it and some people don't. And you can really prepare them as best you can to do it. But, you know, at the end of the day, they've got to, they have to, to carry that torch into the classroom and keep it burning. So, um yeah, so I found myself a teacher at age 50, and um, wow, I it, it, I never set out to do that, you know, but it is one of those turns in my life that has just blessed me beyond belief um, in, in so many ways. And I'm so, so grateful for the experience. Uh, it, it absolutely is the hardest thing that anyone can do. I, I mean, our, our health workers, you know, we have people on the front lines right now that are, you know, it's even harder for them than it is. But honestly, teachers and, and health professionals and, oh, yeah. anyway, uh, I digress. <laughs> a class every day and to have material prepared and to present it in a way that you get that I light up like I got it mm -hmm. that's amazing but to do that to go every single day in front of a group of a group of students you know I only had my three and that was I always I was always in awe of teachers who could you know, you know, because you're basically you have a captive audience, but man, if they're bored, you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, you are for sure. And the other thing is every year, like you couldn't ever rest on your laurels ever. No, no you can't. You, you had to because everything was constantly changing. The district curriculum might be changing or the administration's, you know, ideas about the campus might be changing. One year I had five different preps, you know, art one, sculpture one, pre-AP art two, pre-AP sculpture two, and then another, I had five preps. Man, th that year was not a great, I mean, somebody was always falling a little short because I could not keep all those balls in the air the way I really wanted to, right? So, yeah, my I last think. my last high school school teaching job was four preps, and one of them was uh, AP biology. Oh gosh, uh, yes. Yeah, and I know exactly what you mean. Uh, to keep up with all of those and keep those churning at a high level is is just physically impossible. Uh, but no, I, I, I people you know people get on a rant about teachers. Oh, they only have to work nine months of the year and three months off, and uh, they get Christmas and spring break and blah 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 blah. And I tell every one of them, until you stood every day for a week in front of, front of five classes and provided meaningful information to these students, and like Beth said, to, and, and they're not bored, they're engaged, until you've done that, uh, I don't want to hear uh, what you think about teaching because you, you have no clue. Uh, you know, the teacher who's, you can always tell the teacher who's uh, supervising a a basketball game in the evening they're the ones sitting at the top of the bleachers grading papers oh uh, yeah for you know sure. don't don't tell me about that because the the commitment is all in for those nine months and then the three months you're trying to take classes to advance your own education and or just regain your sanity so you can function again in the fall so right, uh, right. you know it, yeah don't tell me about those things but um yes yeah, so, all right so that's that's interesting to me because 
you know, most teachers start out as 21, 22 year olds, have zero life experience, and and uh, are gaining that while they're teaching. So you had a whole ton of life experience, and then you come in to uh, teach art. So it, it wasn't any easier for you. Uh, well, that, that's interesting. But then also, you found a way to incorporate fiber arts into mm. what is is I mean, painting, ceramics, photography. Yes. You know all those yes. things. You found a way to to get that in. That's uh, that's admirable. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it it it's it was my passion, and I think. One of the things that is interesting about fibers uh, is that fibers are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They're on our bodies. They're, we sleep under them. They're on our furniture. I mean, they are literally everywhere. And so generally speaking, people take fibers for granted. They, they just don't even think about them. Um, however, when you work with students and adults and you – help them, you teach them how to embroider or how to weave or, you know, any number of, of processes, there is a meditative quality to it that really just calms people down. And, and the kids, um, would, they wouldn't act out. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) it's amazing. Um, and I will say that largely, the, you know, the kids were able to do it. I, uh, the room, my last art classroom was ginormous. It was like 1800 square feet. And so I had a smokes. Whoa. (laughs) I know that's a lot of real estate to keep up with. (laughs) And so I went to my weaving community in Texas and asked my friends, um, about starting to teach the kids weaving. And, and they, in one year, I raised uh, over $15,000 worth of either funds to buy looms or equipment that was donated to me or tools or materials. And uh, I call this obtainium, something that can be had for little or no cost. And so once I put the word out, because I've been uh, a fiber artist in Texas for decades and have a wide circle of friends and man, the love just started pouring in. And so my classroom, I had 20 rigid head of looms. Uh, I also wrote a grant for my school district and got another 10 looms from that grant. And I just, you had a factory. You didn't have a classroom. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. And I tell you the staff and the students, they loved it. And then I had floor looms and I want to tell you this one story. Um, there was this kid, this young man, and he, in my art class, it was my sculpture class, this kid had the most deadpan face. Like, there was no expression at all, ever. Not happy, not sad. I mean, I can sort of read people pretty quickly, and I could never get a read on this kid. And I and he he wove a scarf on a rigid head of loom, and then he wanted to weave some more. And if he finished a scarf, then I let you graduate to one of the little floor looms, and I had it warped up for uh, table runners. You guys, this kid sat down and started weaving, and he started smiling. Oh. And he ended up making a table runner for his mom. And I tell you, that is the juice of teaching right there, you know, is, is making the connection, not with me particularly, but just finding a place where they found happiness and some contentment. Um, so yeah, we, we did a lot of, of that. And this last Monday I taught, uh, in a school district around Dallas, Fort Worth, 50 art teachers, uh, K-12 art teachers. So it was ranging all those age groups. And we did um, uh, a thing called paper cloth in the morning, and th- which is a really interesting material that can be used in 
a, a wide variety of ways. And then in the afternoon, we did needle felting, which, of course, you guys know is, is like pure magic uh, and, and pure happiness. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I continue, even though I'm not in the classroom teaching any longer, I've been retired about three years, I call myself the fiber fairy and everyone in the, in the area uh, kind of knows that if they have, if they have stuff to donate or if they have equipment that they're looking for, if, you know, if they need someone to lead a professional development that they'll contact me. And I'm, I'm just so proud and happy to be able to continue doing that work. Um, Cause it means so much to me. So, so I want to ask you the the paper cloth. What did they think about? Because I've made that, and I I just use some for binding a book. Um, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, they loved it because you know you can you can draw on it, you can make it into a two D thing, you can stitch on it, you can embroider on it. I had my sculpture students make paper cloth, and then they covered their sculptures in paper cloth. So it was uh, we used it as a surface design. Um, and I've done it with little kids, third graders, you know, to high schoolers. Um, and I love bookmaking, Beth. And so I've used paper cloth a lot for making uh, book covers. And our my uh, art students, we made it to cover their sketchbooks. Yeah, it's, it's a fabulous material because you can basically add anything to it, you know, to your your muslin is what I would always use. Okay, yes. wait, wait, wait. Yes. Ba back up, back up the truck. Dumb guy question here. What is paper cloth and how do we make it? Well, I got I'll no clue. You, so I'll tell you real quickly because, because well, then we'll talk about some other stuff. But I, I'm my, um, I have an Explore Fiber YouTube channel and I have a, uh, a video about how to make paper cloth. It is super simple. It's just, you just use glue water and muslin and tissue paper or other papers or fabrics, and you literally just glue them together. And when they dry, they make this really interesting, uh, robust material that still is flexible, and you can just do a lot of stuff with it. So, it, it's great fun. And and I taught it to my guild at one point in time, um, and then I think we. We did a little stitching with it. I can't actually mm -hmm. remember. Mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. was, I wanted to know how do you make this, and I was like, okay, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's just make some. Yeah, it's great. And 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 I just love it that you can you paint over you can paint over it, stamp on it, and then you can add another layer of of stitching on top. It it just is a great mixed media. Um, hmm. It is. It is. So. You, the, your your listeners and you can go um, check out this video and it'll tell you everything you need to know about paper cloth. All right. One more thing to learn. Every time we do one of these shows is one more thing to learn. So, okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. So you, you've got sewing, basketry, needle felding, dyeing, embroidery, knitting, crochet, all the techniques. But these days, weaving is your world. What What happened put you in the, on, on the path of weaving and, and seems to have you locked in there? Well, you know, I, I continue to do those other things. They're, they're always a part of, of my practice. But the weaving, I, I started weaving when I was 19. So this year I will have been weaving 48 years. Um, I don't know what to say. Weaving is just my jam. I, you know, I, I say when I sit at the loom, I just really feel my heart beating and I've woven any kind of thing you can weave over this timeline. I have woven, you know, like baby blankets and, and table linens and art concept pieces. I wove a rug once and, you know, it, it, I just love to weave and um but in the 90s and I'm a, a member of the Dallas Hen Weavers and Spinners Guild and the Fort Worth Weavers Guild and we have a state guild and you know so I'm very connected to the weavers of the state of Texas 
<clears throat> but in the 90s, we had a workshop, and I tell this story frequently that I was a young mom. I didn't think I had the money or the time to go to the workshop, but I needed to go play. And so I was like, okay, um, I, I'm going to go play and do it. Well, Donna Kaplan came and taught weaving with wire. And so we had this three-day workshop. And at the end of that three days, what's so interesting now that I look back on it, I completely stopped weaving with, with yarn as my warp. And the only thing I did was weave with wire. So, you know, on a loom, the, the warp or the vertical threads that stretch out across the loom and are under tension. And then the, the weft is the, the yarn that you carry back and forth on the shuttle. So I just, for really for 25 years, I only had a wire warp on my loom and I started making jewelry. Um, it, it makes a fabric that's, that's, I call it a woven metal fabric. And it's, also magical, if I can just say that, um, <laughs> because it has s structure and strength to it so that you can create sculptural objects. And, and I am very much a 3D kind of girl. I love 3D things. And so um, this woven metal fabric is amazing. So what has been so great, and this is where the teaching and the weaving have, have sort of merged um, over the course of, 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 you know, when we started being locked down. I, I used to teach weaving with wire workshops to various guilds, and I would travel around and, and teach people how to do it. But, of course, we couldn't do that. So this September, I launched... Uh, my weaving with wire course on on Teachable platform, which I want to give a big shout out to Teachable. They've got a great platform to to do this on, and um, and so I've been able to put it together as a self paced course or as a three day Zoom workshop, and so I conduct a, a virtual workshop. You know, we go into the Zoom room. And I can just see what you're doing back there in the back of your studio. So I've got my <laughs> eyes on you the whole time. But, um, you know, I don't know, you guys, that I would have, without that teaching experience, you know, I don't know that I would have had the courage to, to put myself out there like that, right? Um, um, but during my teaching, you know, I would teach teachers and and you know when you it, it's so much easier to look back on your life isn't it <laughs> <laughs> and 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 understand that oh I had to do that so that then I would be able to do this so that then I could do that so you you see how everything uh really scaffolds in your life and and builds your experience and your knowledge to the point that you can take it to a, another level and I like it how you said you you decided even though you you didn't think you had the money or the time that but you needed to take time to play. Um, that statement is is just resonated with me when I looked at your information beforehand because I think that's true. Talk, Gary and I talk about it often that um, sometimes you don't take time to play. Um, you know, taking a workshop to expand what you're learning. Um, you know, maybe. You know, I'm not a weaver, but it, it intrigues me. There's something because it, it seems very, in a lot of ways, rigid because you've got um, the, I can never remember what the, the vertical threads are called, but they're, they've got to be set up and those are, those are there and you've got to incorporate your design using your horizontal. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, it seems like that would, that in itself would make a mental um, challenge. Well, listen, like any thing y you can spend your entire life. I, I will spend my entire life exploring weaving. I will never get to the edges of it ever. Uh, you know, there, 
I mean, there are world traditions, there are cultural traditions. I mean, you can go down so many little rabbit holes um, in the weaving world. And actually, weaving with wire is kind of a rabbit hole. Not everyone is really interested uh, to do that, but um, there's nobody teaching it quite the way that I am. And so honestly, the reason I'm doing this, I just want this information to be out there in the world. You know, I'm coming into the autumn of my life and I can see that the clock is ticking. I, I don't have infinite time. So, um, this has been a huge goal and priority for me. And, uh, just to get the information out there so that other people will have the ability. Um, and I'm not supposed to really talk about it, but I do have a book deal in, in, in the works as well, which will go unnamed, but I'm in the process of, of, you know, doing that. And so it won't be just online. Hopefully it will also be out there in a book. Well, that's great. Compare, Compare wire weaving with wire to weaving with regular regular yeah, fiber. Um, is is it uh, is there considerably more setup, or is it the same basic process? You're just dealing with stiffer uh, fibers. Yeah, it's the same basic process. Um, you know, wire is a lively material, so you just have to learn how to control it. And and so I, you know, teach the weaver how to. Uh, make their warp and how to beam the warp onto the loom. Right now, the the instructions are for people who have floor looms or small table looms. Um, I, when I kind of get through this, I'm going to start exploring wire on rigid heddle looms, which is a whole. It's a similar type of loom, but it's different. Um, in some ways and so it's it's uh it's a lot like weaving uh on a just a regular kind of thing but not you know it's it it is you know apples and oranges are both fruit but let's let's be real they're they're apples and oranges right <laughs> now is is the when, when you actually get to the weaving I, I i watched a couple of your videos there the preparation work is fascinating to me it, I'm sure tedious at times, but really fascinating just to just to get to the point where you can weave. But then that hypnotic kind of click clack as you're weaving, does that still happen with the with the wire? Is it? It, it does. It does. And and it it is. Oh, gosh, it is just a centering, meditative, calming place. It, you know, it is really repetitive but in a way that depending on what you're doing, you don't have to think about it so much. You, you just can kind of stop thinking. And, um, and then there's just the, the satisfaction. What I love about weaving with wire, you're creating your own unique art material. Like you can't go out and buy this anywhere. You know, you have your own material that you've created to make your sculpture or your jewelry out of, um, or a basket. And so I love that it's so customizable, um, uh, in that way. And, and it's, it's just fun. And, you know, I'll put a warp on, I'll weave like 12 yards, weave that off and it goes pretty quickly and and then you have all this yummy stuff to play with and oh <laughs> gosh I, and I love looking at it I was I was like oh look at that shine there oh mm, that looks like it'd be fun to you know add to mixed media to bend to yes stitch. I was like okay mm -hmm. yes did you did you order a, a loom Beth I, I have not ordered a loom. I'm trying to <laughs> train. Trust me. Trust me. I've been tempted more than once to order now, a loom. Now, let me just say, you don't have to order a loom. You could find one to borrow that would give you an opportunity to oh, oh, test go, go, it Christine, out. Go, Christine. I'm just going to sit back and let you tempt her. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
with all those weavers in your community, you just need a loom to borrow and, and, and try it out and see if you like it. So, well, and I have a friend who, um, who actually used to have her loom at the local library and she would, she set it up so the kids could do like a, just, just play on it, uh -huh. not play, but supervised play. And they loved it. And oh, yeah. So I do have a friend that has a loom, so I'll have to, <clears throat> I'll talk to her. You should talk to her. But I used to do that. I used to go demonstrate in, in my daughter's schools every year. And, and you know, what was interesting, Gary, especially in elementary school, but even through high school, it was the boys that were interested in the weaving. They were just really fascinated about the equipment and about the tool and about the, how the mechanism worked. And um, I just think that's really great. Uh, you know, different cultures, uh, in some cultures, the men are the weavers and some others, the women are the weavers. It kind of depends. But, um, you know, it's, it's a, a process from the the earliest, I, I think, as I'm researching for my, my book, Gosh, woven fabrics go back 3,000 years. So people were weaving back then on very simple stick looms. And, and you know, you can look at, at Greek pottery and see images of, of the Greeks weaving on upright looms and spinning yarn in the Egyptians. I mean, it's, it's, it's an ancient, ancient craft. And... Um, I'm so proud to still be carrying the light of it in, into this time. Yeah, I meant to ask you about that uh, throughout all your educational efforts, uh, students, adults, whatever it might be. The, uh, you know, when I do this thing in a, in basically in a female world, um, did, did you find that, that uh, men, boys, men, whatever, uh, would dig into whatever fiber thing you were doing or was there a hesitation that you had to help them get over? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, Mr. Miller has encouraged me to buy equipment, even though he didn't really want to operate the equipment. Like when, uh, electric, he, he was like, Oh, you need to get this computerized knitting machine. And I'm like, <laughs> really, do I really? And I did. So I, I, I think it's kind of both. And then just recently I have an elder male that I've been teaching how to weave and he just doesn't have the experience of um, sort of that fine motor skill from his life experience. You know, I think if a guy was a model maker or, you know, if he liked to build um, things, there's a, a, Wow, what am I trying to say? There's there's sort of a hand-eye coordination that's helpful when you are uh, in these kind of, you know, with weaving and fiber is a soft material. So you kind of have to learn how to be the boss of it. So it's not the <laughs> boss of you. But, you know, it, it just depends on the individual. I, I find we have some male weavers in our community and, and um I love seeing what they do. You know, everyone kind of focuses on like one of our weaver, my weaver friends, he, it's, he just weaves rugs, but boy, he, he's a rug weaver and he loves weaving rugs and then a bunch of liturgical um, fabrics for his church. Oh, that, that's what he focuses on. Yeah. Okay. Just hoping to see those, those uh, stigmas of uh, doing needlework or, fiber anything uh, hey, well hey didn't you see that that british swimmer that was knitting right um, right it, yeah boy the fiber community went wild over that it <laughs> yeah. was like it was great yeah i applauded him because uh i i don't have the courage to do that i mean I, i'll sit here in my little room with the with the tv on and and for hours i don't mind but to take it out in public uh, i've only done it a few times it makes me very nervous so um, just seems so out of place and people look like, like, what are you doing? And yeah, I don't know. Um, I should probably just ignore it all and do what I want to do, but. Well, I'm going right. to say yes, Gary. You know what I used to say to my uh, students all the time? I still do. 
No guts, no glory, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say, as as I've uh, gotten older, I care less what people think. I think we all do that. Um, yeah. And so I found it easier to do, but um, still, it's always kind of gives me a little, yeah, whatever. Hey, speaking of Mr. Miller, we have to talk about your coral reef exhibit. What a collaboration you guys had on that. Uh, how did how did that come about? I mean, that is a, an amazing thing. Well. Uh... Toward the end of my teaching, the, uh, there was an opportunity, and this was another fearless, like the universe put it in my head to go up to this gal who was in charge of this little white box gallery at the Texas Discovery Gardens and ask if I could submit for to do a solo exhibition, which I'd never done. And I had seen, um, back in the early 2000s, the... I think it's called the Figurine Institute, but these women did this hyperbolic crochet and they started creating these groups. Well, well, groups just started creating around the world that would do these crocheted coral reefs. They were amazing. And I wanted to do that in the worst way and thought about doing it with my students, but it just never happened. So when I submitted uh, this particular gallery because it was at the texas discovery gardens the only requirement was it had to have a nature theme and so i'm like okay duh i'm doing a coral reef <laughs> and um and the gallery was not really huge but it was it's big enough it was like 17 feet deep and 35 feet long so it it was a big enough space to have to fill and initially, I thought I would do everything fiber. I would do the wall pieces fiber and do the sculpture. But Mr. Miller had started playing with some resin painting, and it was very, um, it, 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 as it just happened out, his early pieces were blue. And the minute we put them up on the wall, I just said, oh my gosh, dude you have to do this exhibit with me <laughs> <laughs> and you do all the 2d paintings and I'll do all the 3d sculpture. Well, Mr. Miller and I will be celebrating our 34th anniversary this year. And he's always been artistic. Um, but during most of our marriage, he was the working man. He went to work and he was in construction supervising and, he didn't allow himself, Beth, time to play. Um, he, I know. He just would work, work, work. So we both retired on the same day. We both retired <laughs> the last day of my school year, June 2nd, 2018. And here's what I had to do, because in our early life, I would ask Mr. Miller to, to collaborate with me because he was artistic always. And he would just say, mm, no, I don't think so. So to get him to do this, I literally got down on bended knee and took his hands in mine. And with a tear in my eye. Oh, no you lie, worked it. You worked it. <laughs> I asked him if he would please collaborate with me on this exhibition. And he probably reluctantly <laughs> <laughs> said yes. And um, so it, we, we have just been installing our third exhibit yesterday and the day before it's going to be in Keller, Texas. Um, and I have to tell both of you, it has been of all the things I've done in my life, it fills me with so much happiness and love and the fact that we are doing this together, you know? Um, and he, he kind of creates his paintings. Like we, we have an outside studio space from our home. Um, and he creates his paintings and I create my sculpture and we don't really, like I don't go and say, hey, I need a painting to go with this sculpture, right? Or vice versa. But 
when we hang this work together, oh my gosh, there is just a synergy about it and a dance that is just, I, I just love it so much. I'm so proud of what we're doing just because I'm proud that we're able to be joyous in our expression of what we both like to do. Right. And, um, so it's been, it's been kind of remarkable. I, I will say he's, a, he's a little bit of a temperamental artist. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I can't, I, he, he's made these little sculptural resin clouds that are so cool. And for this show, I was like, honey, we need more, we need more resin clouds. And has he made any more resin clouds? No, he has not. <laughs> so I, I, he doesn't let me boss him around. Let me just say that. And occasionally he will invite me to help him collaborate from an artistic standpoint, just because you know, I was the teacher and I know more about <laughs> art concepts than, or maybe I just think about it differently. But anyway, it's, uh, it's fun. So yeah, we, our next exhibit opens next week and I'll be up through the end of February and, um, it's looking good. So, all right. So the, the coral reef was the first one and you, this is your third one. What, uh, what are the subjects for the second and third? That, they're all coral reef. Oh, really? All, oh. Yeah. And, you know, we've sold work um, from each of the exhibits. And so the collection uh, is always changing a bit. Of course, we don't sell everything. But, you know, so some stuff goes away and then new stuff comes in. And, and uh, yeah, we, we are continuing to explore even new ideas within that coral reef and you know i i do want to say one thing about this um so both of our work is sort of abstract in a way and i think that over the many years of my making woven metal sculpture um you know people come to it and they're, and they're like well what is it uh and of course it doesn't have to be anything, right? It's <laughs> sort of, it's an abstract piece of art. But but I used to teach AP art history and, and, and even with my students, I think that, and this is a generalized statement, but there's a sizable percentage of the, of the population that doesn't really understand about abstract art. And there's not really an easy entry point for them. Once you put a narrative around that, um, which for us has been coral reef. Now our abstract paintings and sculptures have a completely different context. And the viewer can look at that abstraction and see it in a whole nother way. So it's been really helpful, I think, for us to be able to have that narrative and um, I don't see us really leaving it any time in the near future. But and plus, you know, Gary is a science teacher. Nature is the most fantastical uh, resource for art inspiration. Uh, and it's it's just gosh, it's so exciting. You can just make art about nature and life and the world and. Well, it's, yeah, and it's such an effective way to put out the overriding mess message about taking care of our environment. And coral reefs are are so vulnerable as the as yes. the globe warms up, because uh, you know those those are ancient organisms that have not had to evolve because they've lived in such a rock stable environment for millions of years. And as the you know the, the global warming in in the bigger context of the the life of this planet is such a rapid thing that they're not able to adapt and they're dying reefs are dying everywhere so when i see these kinds of things where you're you're calling attention to the beauty and color and shapes and textures of, of coral and 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 reefs in general uh it, it really is is such a powerful way of showing to people this is something that needs to be protected and this is what we, this is one of the bigger things that we're damaging as as the as the earth warms up. So, 
you know, I applaud you for putting this together and keeping it going because it's so important. Well, even our last exhibit, I used it as an educational platform and I had uh, signage, uh, small action steps, you know, little bites of information like how much plastic goes into the ocean every year and and what and what you can do what is one thing you can do you know and it may seem like a small thing but small things add up and and i know in my household i've been on a mission to eradicate plastic packaging and and i've made a lot of inroads in our household to um uh, eliminate plastic. So, it, you know, I do use it as as an advocacy tool, and I think that's one of the powers of art is it's it's a really powerful advocacy. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, 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 yeah, we just need more of that, more, more, more. Yes, Christine, thank you. This is uh, well, we knew it'd be a treat when we before we started, but uh, really, really have enjoyed the conversation and. And learning about your journey and, and what you're producing. Now, people uh, could go to your website, christinekmiller.com, but then we also have the Teachable Classes uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, website for that, and so people can take classes from you. Then we've got a book coming out. When when is that going to be available? Mm, it's like say? spring spring of 2023. Okay. You know, maybe that's. We'll see, but <laughs> so it's a while. It takes it takes time. Yeah. Um. Right. But they can follow me on my Instagram too. I'm I'm very active on that, and that's uh, at Christine K Miller Fiber Artist uh, on Instagram, and then I've got a Facebook page as well. So. Right. So lots of places to follow you. Uh, lots of videos. Um, boy, I really enjoyed as we were doing research on you. Uh, several videos. One that struck me, uh, a young lady pulling off, uh, must have been a, a wire weaving thing that she did. It was a thin strip uh-huh. that she was pulling off and winding up. And you, know, you, you watch that for a bit, but then I locked in on her face. Uh-huh. The smile and the satisfaction and the joy as she pulled that off the loom I, I was just captivated there because you could just tell for her it was it was a moment in time that uh, that she'll always remember pulling that off and uh, uh, yeah so so for me it was this is this is the culmination or the you know the pinnacle of what you do is is to deliver that kind of satisfaction uh, with weaving and you know what that was her very first weaving experience uh, oh, which. Me which made it even greater. And I just want to give a shout out to both of you for the longevity and the depth and the breadth of the work that you do with your fiber talk. That is really impressive. And I personally, as someone who is trying to bring fibers into the world, I thank you for the work that you do. Oh, well, thank you. We enjoy doing it every minute of it. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. All right, Christine, thanks so much. We appreciate it, and thanks to everybody for listening.